Welcome to the Independent Advisors Podcast, where we dive into the world of stocks, tradable markets, and financial planning with Jessup Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer, Mark McEvely, and CEO, Matt Jessup. You'll hear tips, tricks, and strategies to address your financial well-being, and most importantly, conveyed in a way that everyone can understand. Here are your hosts, Mark and Matt. Hey, everyone. So 231 of the Independent Advisors podcast, where Matt Jessup and I, Mark McEvely, bring you everything you need to know from the past week in the world of financial markets and financial planning. Uh, this week, our Director of Research and Trading, Nick Whitaker, is back on the show. So good morning, Nick. Good morning. Good to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, accommodating the uh, remote podcast again today. I uh, finally succumbed to COVID. I avoided or eluded it for <laughs> what almost four years now. Um, Very long time. So yeah. Finally, yeah, a long time. So um, feeling better, but unfortunately, just don't want to get anyone sick. Um, but also positive of working from home is I get to wear my festive Christmas sweater, uh, my notorious sweater for anyone who is uh, watching the YouTube uh, page. So this is probably one of my favorite sweaters that I only get to wear once or twice a year. So that's a plus, right? Yeah, 100 percent. That's uh, I think that's the first thing that I that I commented on when we jumped on this uh, <laughs> this call. It's a fantastic just for, sweater. Just for you, buddy. Just for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, as always, quickly, quickly review the uh, month to date and year to date performance of the major market indices that we track. This data is from Y charts and as of the market close on December 20th. S&P 500 index up 2.9% in December and up 22.4% for the year. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 3.1% for the month, up 11.9% for the year. The NASDAQ Composite Index up 3.9% for the month and up 41% for the year. The Russell 2000 Small Cap Index up 9.3% for the month and up 12.6% for the year. And finally, the uh, Vanguard All World X United States ETF up 0.4% for the month and 8.8% for the year. Three-month treasury rate at 5.44%, the two-year treasury rate 4.34%, and the 10-year treasury rate sub 4% and 3.86%. First time we've seen that uh, for some time this year. Uh, moving on to big headlines, current events from the week, nothing too pressing. Uh, there's a Bloomberg report that the U.S. and its allies are considering military strikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen. Um, and I think the big one, Nick, was that there was an NBC News report. The Chinese President Xi told President Biden at their San Francisco meeting last month that China will reunify Taiwan uh, with China, preferably peacefully, but that the timing of that reunification has not been determined. And I think we've talked about it before on the show, and we've definitely talked about it you know, with clients, is if that were to occur and it wasn't peacefully, then that would be uh, a major shock to the global economic system. Um, because I think, I don't know if many people realize how dependent the global economy is on Taiwan for technology these days, and specifically yeah. semiconductors, which yeah. is in everything these days, right? Um, so that would, that would definitely uh, uh, pose an issue. And I don't know. I could be wrong, but I just don't see any way that that happens peacefully because I don't think the rest of the world wants that to happen. So, um, yeah. you know, something to keep an eye on, but definitely, uh, you know, not going to influence uh, anything uh, that we do until, um, you know, we need to take action on it. So, yeah, I don't, I don't peacefully would, would surprise me because, like you said, the rest of the world doesn't want that to happen and Taiwan doesn't want that to happen either. Um, right. But that's that's why this is so heavily watched, and you covered on it. it. It all has to do with with chip chip manufacturing, and um, obviously that falling under China's control. Um, you know the the global economy doesn't doesn't love that. Um, but the, you know the the industry has made some strides to try to diversify away from China over the past few years, but it's. It's not something you can do quickly. I mean, I, and and some people probably don't realize how 
complicated it is to make chips. Yeah. Um, like the room for making a semiconductor chip is has to have less dust particles than a hospital operating room. Yeah. Um, so they're they're very difficult facility. It's not like you can just pop one up over the weekend, you know. So it, yeah. it'll take the industry yeah. time to, you know, like a diversify right. away. But that is just kind of a, a, a short term and has been for a couple of years now. Yeah, um, and Intel just like near us, you know, an hour, hour and a half away in Columbus. Intel's building a, a semiconductor plant. Um, yeah. That's been going, you know, that was announced a couple of years ago, and you know, we're still, you know, waiting on that. It just takes time. So yeah, it does. Um, one other thing, uh, there was a, another clickbaity headline about demand uh, worries growing from FedEx's earnings report. Um, so apparently FedEx uh, revised their uh, full year, excuse me, 2024 outlook lower uh, in terms of revenue. Uh, and it calls for single digit uh, decline versus guidance that was approximately flat. Um don't really know what to make of this because FedEx's stock has been uh, pretty strong <laughs> over uh, the past uh, really year. I mean, I'm just pulling up a chart on my end, Nick. And I mean, from October of 2022, it went from 140 to today. Well, okay. Well, two days ago, it was at 280. <laughs> now it dropped to 245 uh, based on the earnings outlook down 12%. But um, you know, maybe that's the, the change of trend, but I mean, I mean, over the past year or so, FedEx has been up over a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is is there's going to be profit taking there for sure when you see that. Yeah. Um, but it 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 grabbed some headlines yesterday with uh, and it just kind of pulling the industrial sector down. Obviously, it's a big a big trend and. For listeners and for list, for regular listeners, you've heard this before. Um, but anyone who who could be new to this, the the earnings cycle is where we hear a lot of these changes of narratives, changes of directions, where you're going to have big bigger moves and profit taking here and there, um, and it's because you're hearing it directly from from the CEO and so. Uh, in the C-suite team, I should say, um, uh, across the across the industries and publicly traded yeah. companies. So, anytime you have a uh, you know a major company with involved in global trade change their their outlook for you know their their next year outlook, this somewhat drastically, you know, when you go from flat to uh, you know negative single digits. Um, you know, there's going to be a reaction there, um, unless you know the street was expecting it. But I don't think here uh, the, the street was necessarily expecting that, which is why you had that kind of pull back a little bit. But like you said, yeah, stocks up 100. percent There's going to be profit taking there. You're still up, yeah, you know, pretty right. big. So it's just kind of a you know a, a readjustment to the risks. Yeah, agreed. Um, well, the first thing I had for listeners in terms of uh, tweets and research this week, Nick, was a tweet from. Uh, Joey uh, Politano on December 12th uh, of this year. And uh, Jenna will throw this uh, graphic up on YouTube video to also be in our show notes. Uh, he tweeted, rent remains the largest contributor to year-on-year CPI inflation, though its impact continues to cool. The contribution of services, excluding shelter, increased while energy remains a small negative contributor and food slash core goods remain small positive contributors. And the main takeaway that I want people to get from this is most of the inflation that we're getting right now is from uh, shelter, so rent, right? Um, And me and you talked about this, Nick, on a questions with uh, Mark and Nick earlier this week or last week. but this is a big deal because uh, rent is not a current number, right? This is uh, lagging data that is used for this CPI inflation calculation. And I really think that if we used current rent numbers for this input, that inflation would actually be a lot lower than what it's showing right now, which I think is a really good thing for the American consumer, the global economy in general, um, that inflation is coming down. And I think, you know, once, you know, this lagging rent data does catch up and as long as everything else kind of stays where it is, 
energy, food, uh, or even continues to come in a little bit, I think you're going to see an environment where the Fed can cut rates because inflation is, is, is lower. And it's not necessarily that they have to ease and bring rates back to zero, but the whole purpose of raising rates in the first place was to combat inflation. And if it's combated and down to their 2% target, you know, what's the reason to hold rates higher, right? Um, so overall, I think this is a good thing. It's a really good graphic. Uh, shows the composition of inflation uh, going back to, you know, 2019, roughly. Um, so uh, really good information here uh, about the American economy. Yeah, I like the graphic a lot. It's a really good chart. Uh, second thing I had was an article on Morningstar by Amy Arnott, uh, CFA titled, Should You T-Bill and Chill? Um, so uh, I think we might have talked about this a little bit before earlier this year, Nick, um, but I thought this was uh, a good uh, a good article because this has been making the rounds in the in the media. And, you know, we've gotten this question from clients is, you know, if T-bills are paying five and a half percent, then, you know, why would I even bother to deal with the market? And I think Amy uh, kind of summarized this really well. So I just want to read a few bits from this article. Um, she says cash investors haven't had it this good in years. After a long period of near zero yield, yield on three month treasury bills have been as high as five and a half percent so far in 2023, which is their highest level since December of 2000. The unusually generous yields on cash have led many investors to ask if you can earn a positive real return on treasury bills and other short-term instruments without taking any risk, AKA the T-bill and chill strategy, why not? Well, Amy points out to a couple of reasons, and the first thing is reinvestment risk. Any investment in short-term securities involves reinvestment risk. For example, if you bought a three-month treasury bill with a yield of 5.5%, you'd benefit from that annualized yield until the maturity date. But if, you, but if interest rates drop to 4%, you'd be reinvesting at a lower rate. And I want to pause here, Nick, and just clarify for people, when they see a three-month treasury bill yielding 5.5%, that is annualized. So that's if you held a three-month treasury bill you know, for the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter, and the and interest rates didn't change. And they stayed at 5.5%, you would get 5.5%. 99 percent of the time, that doesn't happen because interest rates are always changing. Interest rates, rates move on the daily, internet, yeah. Right? Yep. So, you know, if you invest in a three-month treasury bill in January and it's at 5.5%, in Q2, it might be 5.3%. Q3, it might be 5.7%. And you get whatever that average is at the end of the year. So that's the point number one that I wanted to make. Number two, the reinvestment risk that she's talking about is – kind of to clarify this even more, if we invest in a one-year treasury bond at the beginning of 2024 that let's say is yielding 5%, Nick, but at the same time, we have the ability to invest in that one-year treasury bond that's yielding 5%, we could invest in a five-year treasury bond that's yielding 4.5%. And we're like, well, you know, we're going to take the higher yield and just stay invested for, for one year. Um, and by the time 2025 rolls around, if rates significantly come in and let's say, you know, we can only get three and a half percent on any length of maturity of bonds, then we're going to be kicking ourselves looking back and saying, oh, we really should have taken that 4.5 percent for five years because rates have come in. So you, you play that game of reinvestment risk on, hey, you know, shorter term usually makes people feel better. But a lot of times if interest rates are going to be falling over the long term, you know, sometimes it makes sense to go out on the duration scale, meaning, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 year uh, bonds. So I just wanted to clarify that uh, for people. Yeah. Uh, second thing she talks about is opportunity cost. Um, she says the biggest issue, though, is that investing in cash doesn't really build long term wealth. That's true even during periods when T bills appear to offer attractive yields. On the equity side, the most convincing results were for subsequent periods when T bills offered a positive yield spread compared with 10 year treasuries. All that means is that 
shorter term government bonds are yielding more than longer term government bonds. And because of the inverted yield curve, often portends a recession, T-bills have had a fairly uh, decent odds of outperforming stocks over the following one, three, and five-year periods. For long-term investors, though, the odds of success were much lower. On average, annualized returns for T-bills lagged stocks by about five percentage points over 10-year periods following a month with an inverted yield curve. So um, I think the data is pretty clear, Nick, that if you're a long-term investor, which most people are, most people should be, um, you know, T-bill and chill isn't really the way to go. Obviously, it could help buffer in the short term, um, but over the long term, it, it doesn't seem like it's, it's that great of a strategy. Um, and she ends up by saying the fact that T-bills don't typically produce strong long-term returns, even at times when they are uh, offering relatively attractive yields, probably seems like an obvious point. As safe assets, they're not expected to generate strong returns. The T-bill and chill strategy might pay off over the shorter term periods as it has over the past 12 months, but it is not a reliable way to build long-term wealth. So um, thought it was a really good summary there from uh, from Amy. And uh, as always, if people want to read the full article, it'll be linked to our show notes. Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, a bunch of very good points and conversations that I know. Uh, we've had with clients about reinvestment risk and opportunity costs and yeah, yeah. very, very well yeah. summarized. Uh, last thing I had was just a quick quote from legendary investor Larry Williams. Uh, he says, quote, be quick to turn bullish, but take your time turning bearish. The market is up more than 70% of the time, end quote. Um, so I thought this was really good. Um, like we talked about before. I think too many people spend too much time preparing for the worst, but they don't prepare enough for the good times, which is the majority of times. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can do, uh, you know, some big, big damage to long-term portfolio returns. So um, thought that that was, that was good. And just wanted to share that with listeners before uh, the end of the year, especially given the year that we've had um, so far, you know, I think you just, you had just before we started recording said, isn't it funny that everyone thought we were, you know, it was going to be the end of the world at the end of October and look kind of what has happened since then in the markets. So, yeah. 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 It's, I mean, it's easy. It's easy uh, from a psychology perspective to, you know, turn, turn bearish and the news is always going to have uh, a bit of a negative slant, even when things are peachy. It's funny. I mean, bearish headlines will be out every year multiple times a quarter. I mean, it's, it's never going to stop. Um, and that makes right. it even harder to kind of maintain that bullish stance. Um, it, that kind of leads me into my next piece pretty well. Um, Great. It's, uh, it's a look at total shareholder return over the past decade. It's research from Charlie Bellello. Um, let's see, about six days ago on the 15th. So a little stale. This is a long-term chart. Um, and he, he created this chart and then he also uh, in the piece quoted Charlie Munger. Uh, the quote is, the first rule of compounding is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. Uh, what he means by that is, you know, don't pull out of the market, right? Um, you stick to your strategy. And this chart shows you what you would have made both uh, cumulative and on an annualized basis. If you were to have pulled out of the market and sold on March 23 of 2020, which of course was COVID towards the bottom, um, if not the bottom of, of COVID. And you can see uh, how drastic that is, um, the differences where you would have made an annualized as you pulled out at the bottom of COVID and just went to cash, like you're saying, short-term investment investment, um, 3.7% annualized versus 12.2% annualized if you would have stayed in the market. Um, it gets back to the chart you're talking about. It gets back to you know, the negativity that we, we, we try to uh, warn against in the headlines is stick to your strategy. The market is higher more often than it is lower. Um, this is a good chart to, to kind of uh, express that. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and I remember having those conversations with clients. I mean, people were scared as they were, you know, as they should have been. Um, yeah, and understandably you know, so. We're not we're not yeah. trying to we're not trying to uh downplay how difficult it feels. We we understand that. Yeah, and this is, you know, this is not to, you know, pat ourselves on the back or any other advisors out there, but I would say that probably any good advisor was saying, Hey, you know, this is not the time to, <laughs> to sell. Uh, it, it, you know, it was, you know, a, a really short, swift uh, pullback. And, you know, looking back on it, it's always easier uh, in hindsight than it is at the moment, but could it have turned into a 50% correction? Yeah, it, it could have, but it didn't. Um, so, you know, it, during these periods of, of short-term volatility, we try to stress to our clients to, to, to ride those out as, as tough as that might be sometimes, but this um, this chart uh, really shows why why we recommend that type of stuff. So yeah, absolutely. the uh, The next piece I have is a uh, is a quick one on uh, it's a tweet from Jonathan Farrow on Fed speak confusion. Fed speak, Your boy. It, yeah, my my man Jonathan Farrow, big <laughs> big fan. Uh, Shout out, shout out to Johnny, uh, which, he does, which he does not go by. Um, anyway, Jonathan Farrow, a, he's a Bloomberg anchor, um, really sharp guy. Uh, but this is a tweet he had from a couple of days and um, it says, Powell, December 1st. It's premature to talk about easing. Powell, December 13th, so about two weeks later. We're talking about the timing of easing. Williams and who he's referring to here, uh, Williams is the the Fed Bank of New York President John Williams. Williams on December fifteenth, two days after Powell, says, "We aren't really talking about it." <laughs> so this is kind of like a ha ha uh, observation from from Jonathan here about Fed speak and how you know this happens all the time. It's constant where, you know, the, the Fed chair will come out and say something and then the narrative changes two weeks and then seemingly the narrative's changed and the market's like, OK, we're listening to the Fed chair. And then another Fed bank president will come out and say something that's like, what, wait, what? You're saying the exact opposite of what Powell said a couple of days ago. Um, right. And so this is this is kind of the. Uh, this is all since I've been in the market, this is pretty par for the course. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think investors and, and listeners should get too hung up on the Fed speak. Um, the market's going to be all over it. Sometimes Fed bank presidents differ. You know, they're, it's a, a group of people in a room and, and there's always going to be some people on one end and, and one and on the other. And then eventually they kind of come into the middle and, and steer the ship. So I wouldn't get too hung up about what one guy says at a certain time versus obviously we listen to Powell more than anything because he's speaking on behalf of the consensus, but just uh, kind of a funny observation. I thought we could. Yeah. Chat. Yeah. I think, you know, I don't really think it does any good for the majority of people to listen to uh, what the Fed says every time they say something. Um, and that's not because I don't think people shouldn't be informed, but there's only like so much information the human brain can take in and digest, right, Nick? So is it good for people to be aware of what interest rates are doing and how the Fed works? Yes, absolutely. But the in-between stuff, it's like it's like information overload. It's like, yeah, it's not worth it to, you know, that's what, you know, me and you are here for. It's part of our job to, you know, digest yeah. these things for clients. But it's, it's like anything else in life is there's only so much time in the day, so much time in the week. And is it worth it to listen to this stuff most of the time? No, I don't. I don't think it is. Yeah, don't don't get too hung up on it. If you uh, if you read any anything about that out there. <laughs> The uh, the last piece I have is from the BOFA Bank of uh, Bank of America, uh, the BOFA Fund Manager Survey, which is a chart that sh showing managers are uh, bullish on bonds. Uh, I picked this up from a, a reporter. Uh, she reports all over the, the financial side of things. Uh, Gunyan Bajeri, um, 
says the following investors haven't been this bullish on bonds in 15 years according to the bank of america fund manager survey and it shows a chart here that shows the net percentage of overweight to bonds and i can can uh tell you that i think a lot of this just has to do with with the interest and rate the interest rate environment that we're in so you're going to see people kind of uh, what we talked about a little bit earlier some investors are going to be locking in some of those medium intermediate bonds some investors are going to be more on the short side of the curve and taking advantage of that some investors are seeing this up as an opportunity to go into the high yield market and pick up some risk on the long term for clients and some investors for extremely conservative clients might be buying more long term bonds so there's there's a lot of good reasons to be getting into bonds at this point in the market regardless of where you are on the maturity cycle and so i think that's that's kind of what you're seeing in the chart um um but you know, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I uh, part of this makes me a little nervous because you know we've heard all year that um, you know we should we should be bullish bonds and that you know rates eventually are going to come down and it seems like that's the overwhelming uh, majority of the way people are thinking mm-hmm. and it just kind of takes me back to an interview I listened to of Stan Drunkenmiller uh, earlier this year. Um, that he said that he doesn't necessarily think buying bonds is as fat of a pitch as most people are making it out to be. So when he said that, and then everyone's like, oh my God, and, you know, you've got to buy bonds, interest rates are coming down. I'm sitting here like, oh my God, one of the most legendary investors all time is saying, you know, this isn't as fat of a pitch as people think because of what the Fed has done. I'm like, oh, okay, now my brain's really, really wrapped and really messed up. Um, so we'll see. Um, we'll see how bonds react to if, you know, we do get this higher for longer and when I, in terms of interest rates. And when I say that, it's just not going back to a 0% rate environment. So whether that's between 2 and 4%, I don't, I don't know. But we'll see how, how bonds react to that rather than them reacting to cutting to zero. Um, so certainly going to be interesting over the next uh, the next couple of years. But bonds usually aren't uh, negative two years in a row. Um, so mm-hmm. I don't know. Just looking at history, I would say, you know, at some point here, bonds are due to to, to have a good year. Yeah, to to kind of positively react. And I think there's a lot of things that we can, you know investors are doing in the short term you know uh, along with what stan is saying and i i get it you know i i think i think we uh we prefer more of the the short end of the curve right now um and and you know maybe the intermediate for certain circumstances i get that but it's like you said if you're gonna be higher everyone, for longer everyone's like go out go out on the curve go out on the yeah. curve and i'm like yeah that you know that that I have an issue with that when everyone's telling me to do that. <laughs> yeah. And and for listeners who like just to kind of clarify that up for, for the average the average person, um, when we say higher for longer, if the interest rate, if the if the Federal Reserve keeps interest rates at this peak level for longer than the market is is expecting, then most likely we'll be able to the, the reinvestment risk goes down because you'll be able to reinvest at those shorter bonds and get some higher yield and then eventually go out on the curve it it, the higher for longer you'll be able to balance those two risks of opportunity cost and reinvestment risk because if you're locking up a bunch of money on the long end of the curve and then rates stay higher for longer you could have your opportunity cost is you could have invested in something that gives you a greater opportunity to increase overall wealth right so that's that's kind of the the, the narrative there so i didn't realize how well all this stuff was going to tie in together <laughs> yeah it was great i'm glad that uh we kind of just yeah. our our items played off of each yeah, other so that, that worked out uh anything else for you to add on that no no not on that topic um i'll move on to the financial planning topic of the week uh again this was a article written by matt uh Bazden with uh plan corp titled 11 different retirement plans different types of retirement plans. And uh, this week, we're, we're going to follow up last week's discussion with common types of individual retirement accounts. 
Uh, last week, we discussed employer-sponsored retirement plans, so check out episode 230 if you want to hear about the pros and cons of different types of employer-sponsored retirement plans. But uh, we're going to talk about, just again, bringing it back to the basics of the two most common types of um, you know individual retirement accounts, and the first being the traditional IRA. So uh, the traditional IRA is an account that allows individuals to save for retirement while providing significant tax benefits. Individual retirement accounts are not employer-sponsored. If you want to open one, you can work with a financial institution or have a financial advisor open one for you. In 2024, IRA contributions are capped at $7,000 for people under 50, and $8,000 for people 50 and over. Some pros of a traditional IRA, contributions may be tax deductible, your money grows tax deferred, you may have more investment options than with an employer-sponsored plan, and anyone with taxable income can contribute. So uh, just to pause and talk about those last two bullets, Nick, when you have a individual retirement, more individual retirement account, more likely than not, you can invest in anything that's publicly traded, right? So there's more investment flexibility when it comes to a, uh, an individual retirement account compared to a 401k plan where there's a very limited number of mutual funds that you're able to select from to be able to invest your money. Um, the, the second point, anyone with taxable income can contribute um, you can only contribute as much as you make, right? So if you only make, you know, if you have a child that's, you know, 17 or 18 and they make $4,000 one summer working, they can only contribute up to $4,000, even though the contribution limit is $7,000 for 2024. Um, the other important thing to note is that if you don't earn taxable income, so say, you know, you have two parents, one's that stay at home and one's working, the person that stays at home is able to set up a spousal IRA uh, that allows that stay at home spouse to save for retirement if you file your taxes jointly. So that's a huge benefit uh, as well. Uh, some cons of the traditional IRA is that they have low contribution limits compared to employer sponsored plans. Again, last week we talked about this. Employer sponsored plans have 20 plus thousand uh, dollar contribution limits. Uh, you pay income tax on the money when you withdraw it, and early withdrawals may be subject to penalties. So if you take money out of your traditional IRA prior to age 59 and a half, you will get hit with a 10% early withdrawal penalty in addition to the ordinary income taxes you will pay on that withdrawal from the IRS. So we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Second type, Nick, is uh, a Roth IRA, which has gained popularity over the past couple of years. Um, that says that a Roth IRA is a type of IRA that allows people to save after-tax dollars for retirement. You can open one on your own or work with a professional to set it up an account for you. In 2024, combined contributions to all IRA plans cannot exceed $7,000 for people under 50 and $8,000 for people 50 and over. However, not everyone can contribute to a Roth IRA. Your income determines eligibility. So some pros, withdrawals aren't taxable. Your money grows tax-free. You may be able to use Roth IRA funds for a down payment on your first home. So since your contributions to the Roth IRA are after tax, that money grows completely tax-free. And when you take that money out in retirement, since it's already been taxed, the government won't touch it. Uh, another interesting part of a Roth IRA is that if you are a first-time home buyer, there are uh, certain, um, uh, not requirements, but there are certain uh, scenarios where you're able to take out a certain chunk of money to put down on your first home without any IRS penalty. Um, so that is, is a big benefit as well. Uh, some cons of the Roth IRA, high earners aren't eligible to contribute, contributions are tax deductible, and annual contribution limits are low. Uh, so there are uh, income limitations when it comes to contributing to Roth IRAs. So if you or you and your spouse make over a certain threshold of income, uh, the IRS says, hey, you make too much money to be able to contribute to a Roth IRA, which is very different than the Roth 401k there is no income uh, limit test with a, a Roth 401k. So anyone can contribute to a Roth 401k. 
that is slightly uh, different from a Roth IRA. Um, contributions obviously are not tax deductible since they are after tax contributions. So if you're looking for a way to reduce your, uh, your taxable income, uh, you know, the traditional IRA would probably be the route to, to go if that's your number one goal, uh, because you will not get that deduction from the, the Roth IRA. Um, so again, uh, a lot of things that I think a lot of people, uh, know Nick, but, uh, just bringing it back to the basics here as we get down to the end of December and we're about to head into the new year if people want to start to take control of their finances. Uh, really quickly, just want to mention that if you want to create your own podcast, uh, please use the promo code Jessup Wealth to get your first month of Blueberry Podcast hosting for free. To choose the ideal plan for you, use the hosting estimator on their website. Again, you can receive your first month free with promo code Jessup Wealth, all lowercase and no spaces. Uh, before we sign off, Nick, anything else you want to uh, leave with listeners? Uh, no, no. Happy holidays to everyone and hope everyone uh, enjoys, enjoys the time with family and friends and safe travels. Yeah, uh, I just want to wish everybody a, a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, uh, stay safe, uh, Happy New Year. Um, kind of disappointed, Nick. Uh, Christmas food sometimes is some of my favorite food, and uh, I can't taste or smell anything right now. So, uh, you know, that's yeah. how I, I, I really figured out that I uh, came down with the old COVID, but um, hoping that that goes away sooner rather than later. But it's a real pain in the butt. Like, I even, like, couldn't taste my coffee this morning yeah. uh, so that was a that was a big bummer but um you know it's a, it's amazing how much bigger of an impact that has on like like it happened to me when i got the original covid and uh i didn't think it was gonna bother me that much it's like ah okay so i can't taste something like okay whatever it's like not that big of a deal but it it does it's a real it's a real bummer yeah. yeah, I mean, and for, you know, for people that know me, I love, uh, I love meat. That's primarily most of my diet. And you know, it's, it's bad when like a steak or any meat in general just sounds horrible to me. Yeah. And that's exactly what it does. I took a, a bite of a burger last night and I had one bite and I was like, this is, this is brutal. Everything just tastes like iron. Yeah. Uh, that's so. a bummer. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully you get it back sooner than later. Maybe. Maybe even in time for the for the Christmas. I don't know if you great. guys do, do chicken or turkey or. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely some good food. The big one that we usually do is um, pasta with uh, vodka sauce with some oh, sort okay. of, right. of meat, and you know, dip the the meat into the the pasta sauce. Oh, yeah, oh, it's yeah. going to be very uh, very disappointing if I can't can't enjoy that this year. <laughs> uh, finger, fingers crossed. Fingers yeah. Crossed. Yeah. So uh, once again, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, uh, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the Independent Advisors Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Independent Advisors Podcast. If you're interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button so you can be notified every time a new episode gets released. Feel free to share with friends, family, and follow us on Twitter at Jessup Wealth, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mark and Matt will continue to share beneficial information on these social media sites. Also, check out the podcast tab on their website. That's www.jessupwealthmanagement.com. There you'll find links to every episode of the Independent Advisors. Have questions or topics you want to discuss on the show, message us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or send an email with the words questions and topics in the subject line to inquiries at jessupwealthmanagement.com. We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. Certain sections of this commentary may contain forward-looking statements based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. All indices are unmanaged and are not available for direct investment by the public. 
past performance is not indicative of future results. This podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and does not constitute either tax, legal, or financial advice. Although we do go to great lengths to make sure our information is accurate and useful, we recommend you consult a tax preparer, professional tax advisor, financial advisor, or lawyer regarding your specific circumstances. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. No strategy can guarantee any objective or goal will be achieved.